Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Wayne. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Murray Hill Group in New York City. Don't I sound like it? I want to thank Speaker Tip O'Neill for giving me such a nice <laughs> introduction. You know, I, I really wasn't going to use this line, but you know, when you get one of these people like, like Tip O'Neill, you know, uh, I just can't resist. Now, I see a few of you around here that are about possibly the same height I am. I know you are. You're about my size. Let me tell you about short people. Now, you can get these big guys like Tip O'Neill over here, you know, and they do everything. They bust down doors and everything. But let me tell you what short people are built for. Short people are built for action, traction, and satisfaction. I'm not through with him yet either. <laughs> you know, there is a gentleman here tonight that goes under the title of the Arkansas Traveler. Now, I won't mention Charlie's name, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's some other people from Arkansas, and I happen to be one of them. And I want to tell you something. Now, if you think he's an Arkansas Traveler, he came from the big city. He came from North Little Rock. I came from a little town that's just about one-tenth that size. And I'm up in the hills. He's down there where the flatlands are. So there's a big difference in, in what you call an Arkansas traveler. But I'm also up there where the Razorbacks are. Now, for those of you that are uninitiated, there is something in Arkansas called the Arkansas Razorbacks. Now, that's a football team. It's also a basketball team, and if you saw the playoffs this year, you will note that uh, when it got to the finals, the Arkansas Razorbacks were in there. So the next time you start thinking about the old Arkansas traveler over here, being under the bridge at North Little Rock, remember there's some of us hillbillies up there where, where those Razorbacks come from, uh, that we happen to be, maybe not the Arkansas traveler, but we might be the ambassadors from Arkansas. <laughs> Perhaps I'll get to it. I'll tell you how I, I made the Arkansas Razorbacks uh, hog call, uh, pretty famous uh, in Phillips Petroleum Company. I'll tell you about that perhaps tonight. I came from, a, I actually grew up in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And unlike many of you, and I started drinking at an early age, and I can tell you what it was, when it was, what time it was, and where. I can even tell you what, how the temperature was. But I dearly loved draft beer, and that's what it was. But I had a problem, like many of you, I had a problem with it. I was 15 years old. And I started hitting the jail in Fort Smith, Arkansas at 15 years old. So you can see I, I didn't have to drink long or hard because I was there quick. And uh, I could probably uh, tell you, uh, go look at my rap sheet at the Fort Smith jail there, and you could pretty well figure out when I sobered up how long I drank and everything. But uh, being from uh, uh, the city there, uh, Fort Smith, uh, there was a camp near there called uh, Fort Chaffee. And it was the end of World War II, and many of the, the servicemen were coming back, and a lot of them were coming back to my particular uh, town there, you know, and these guys were coming back through the Marines, and Navy, the Army guys. You know, and they come back in those uniforms, and they were getting all the girls, you know, and you know, they were big, uh, you know, guys, you know, and they'd been through the war and everything, and they were just having a hell of a time. So, you know, uh, I kind of, well, I have to tell you what I was like. I was just like I am right now. I wasn't any bigger than I am now. The only difference was that when I wasn't drunk, I was so shy, so introverted, that I just couldn't even hardly speak. I flunked English in high school because I wouldn't get up in front of people. 
he talked. I wouldn't give a book report. That's how I want to uh, That's a joke today. But, uh, you know, I figured out real quickly that if I went into the service, you know, I would, and I was uh, 17 years old, I figured out real quick that if I went in the Marine Corps, stayed in there, I'd come back and I'd be about the size of Tip O'Neill over here. <laughs> And I'd be just meaner than hell, good looking, and boy, I would have a ball. Now that was not one of the first mistakes I made, but that was one of the many mistakes I made. It's rather obvious I didn't make that. But, you know, I went to uh, a place uh, called the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, California. I joined the Marine Corps. I got out there, you know, and I always tell it, uh, you know, you have certain insights during your life. You know, one of those instant insights where you, you really know what the future is going to be. And I came in to uh, this thing. We got off the train and one of those kind of uh, uh, unpolite sergeants uh, had escorted us up to the barracks. And uh, as we walk up to these barracks and I looked up and there was these guys coming down the stairway. There's just a big window. And these guys come down and their heads were shaved and they had on these old green dungarees that looked like hell. You know, I had this insight. You know, I believe I've screwed up. <laughs> and you obviously can figure out I had. Because if uh, you have the kind of personality I had, you know, you're not too thrilled with some of that He-Man stuff. But anyhow, I survived and got out of boot camp and uh, come up with something. You know, and uh, over in the casual company there. Everybody was getting assignments, going to sea school, radar school, infantry, you know. Uh, some of them going into to, uh, the artillery, everything. My name didn't come up. Finally, everybody's gone, and I'm still there. Finally, my name's put on the board, and they give me a spec number. I went over to the old top sergeant, and I said, well, Gunny, what is this thing? I said, I never heard of this spec number. He looked at it. He said, oh, he says, you're going to go into the Marine Band. Did you ever try to be macho when you're a musician? <laughs> well, it has certain advantages, but I have to tell you, as I said, I wasn't any bigger than I am now. But I didn't know that in those days. <laughs> and I uh, had one incident, and I never have forgotten it. Uh, it's kind of like Franklin talks about uh, red, you know. Yeah, I, w I went into a bar one time in San Diego after I'd gotten out of boot camp and walked in there in my dress blues. And there's an old boy, an old swabby sitting up there at the bar. And he was about like Tip O'Neill over here. And he kind of looked up, you know, looked at that. He says, ain't he cute? <laughs> well, now, if you're a good Marine, and you got, you know, the kind of personality I have. You gotta try. You just gotta try. <laughs> Knowing full well you're just gonna get a stomp completely out of you, but you gotta try. I ended up, I ended up a couple of years on Guam, come back to the States. And they had something called a police action. Now, many of you may not remember it, but I know there's a few of you around here. That police action was called Korean. Uh, war. And bless Harry Truman's heart. Sure don't want to forget how grateful I am to him for giving me another year and shipping me to Korea. We found out that uh, after those two years in Guam, I thought I was going to get out. I was going back to Arkansas, and I was never going to leave there ever again. But they extended me a year, and they also gave me the courtesy of going to Korea. And I got to go to Korea, and they even gave me the courtesy in Korea that I didn't have to play that horn anymore. I was going to get to be a machine gunner. Who be? <laughs> you know, that just didn't do a whole hell of a lot for me. You know, after after nearly three years, and then all of a sudden they won't make a damn Marine out of me. Well, I ended up, and uh, we, uh, we made the landing at Inchon and went through, got up to the chosen frozen reservoir 
uh, you know, come out of there. We come out with uh, about a regiment left out of the division. Come back, and I want to tell you that, you know, if I'd have been a good Marine, I might have done it differently, but I managed to stay drunk quite often. I became quite a winemaker, or if you will, Applejack maker. We aged it three days. And it had a very, very good flavor to it, and you could drink one canteen cup of it and be cold sober and then dead drunk. No in-between. You were one of the two. It worked great for quite a while. But a lot of these things happened, you know, and I got drunk one night, and I decided it was a good idea to go back home. I just didn't like it over there. You know, and it was cold, and there was people dropping things around there, you know, just like they were trying to kill you. And uh, it just seemed like a good idea one night, and I'd been sampling some of this homemade stuff we'd been making. And this machine gun crew, you know, we sit out on the mountains, you know, up on the peaks where we'd have a good feel of the fire. So I wander off, and then, you know, my usual. Anyhow, somebody, I guess, finally directed me back. I don't know. I don't even remember getting back. But anyhow, I wake up. Passed out on top of this hill, and the guy said, Hey, Wayne, you know what you did last night? I said, No, why? He said, You decided to go home. I said, Yeah, really? He said, Yeah. He said, See over there? Pointed down this mountain up to a certain area. I said, yeah. He said, That's a minefield. He said, You walked through that last night. <laughs> Tell me there is something of God. You know, and I, I have another talent. Uh, you, you wouldn't know it, uh, I'm sure, but I have a particular talent for saying the wrong thing to the wrong people. And I had uh, a little thought one day, and I heard that there were some nurses back in this place called Wanju. And I thought, well, you know, I'd sure like to see one of them. It's been a long time since I'd seen a woman. And I don't know, I got to drinking some of that homemade juice, and the more I thought about it, the better I liked the idea. So I caught one of the empty, uh, the trucks was carrying the empty shell casings back to the rear, and I got back there. And I was going over to see these nurses. And they had some SPs there that disagreed with me. And I never did get to see them, but I sure did want to. They brought me back, and this warrant officer that uh, happened to be uh, my commander, and he made some unkind remarks. And I just wasn't in the mood to put up with him, and I just took care of his whole history and his whole lineage uh, that I could think of, and he showed me who was boss, and it wasn't me. <laughs> so I got to be a PFC again. I did this twice. I didn't learn the first time. I did it the second time. And I managed to come out of the Marine Corps out of being a Korean veteran after four years with great talent. I had one hash mark and one strike, a PFC. Aren't you glad that you got such an intelligent person in charge of your general service office? <laughs> That'll give you a real sense of comfort. I came back and went back, of course, back to the hills there. Discharged, and of course, I'd ended up, I managed to make, uh, just in between the time getting back and 30 days of getting discharged to San Diego to go back home, I managed to end up in, in the San Clemente Jail. Uh, I managed to do several things. I managed to have uh, some of the police in the California area didn't like, I guess, too well some of the things I did. And, they had a little warrant out for me, and uh, so I, I thought it wise to go on back to Arkansas as soon as I got discharged. Got back, and of course, the usual, but I was going to try to go back to school, and got back, and my parents were living in this little town, uh, uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. Went back there, and I thought, well, I'm going to get me a job until uh, uh, school starts. And I have to tell this part of it simply because I've got to explain my wife, me and Marcia, and... Uh, and we got to, you know, I got there and I was asking around about a job and somebody said they had a truck driving job at uh, this place called Armour. So I go down there and this real neat looking little blonde comes up and takes my application and everything and I get the job and they say show up the next morning. This is part that Bill Foster likes. And uh, I uh, 
show up to work the next morning and I go out to the truck and I found out I wasn't going to drive the truck. It seems that I was going to do something else and it was called catch chickens. Now, with my great background and everything, I never had my hand on a chicken in my life. I lie. We go out to go pick up these chickens. And we pull up in front of this brooder house, you know, and there's about four or five of us. We go in, you know, and we can kind of shoot them old chickens up on the end of the brooder house, and everybody dives in, and I got me a couple, and we'll trapes them out to the, to the truck to put them in the cook and load them up. And the old foreman there standing in, he said, no, boy, he says, we don't, we don't. Uh, pick up chickens like that. I said, what do you mean? He says, we, we don't carry just two chickens at a time. I said, what do you mean? He says, we, we carry 12 to 14 at a time. I said, you can't carry 12 to 14 at a time. <laughs> you can. He taught me how. <laughs> you really can. And I want to tell you, I had quite a career at that place. I was ready to quit after that. But it did last till 10.30 that night. And I had to, you know, I kept trying to argue this old boy's on stopping unless get the beer or something, you know. And they was afraid about getting fired. And I was just thinking how great it'd be to be fired before the day was over. <laughs> but you know, at chickens, when you're catching them like that, you know, they have a tendency to peck you, scratch you, and shit on you. I uh, want to tell you that I washed my hair that night at least three times, and I think I washed about three or four times in the tub. The reason I tell this story is, uh, you know, it's interesting. I didn't go back. I resigned. Uh, my check was brought to me by this little old blonde. Her name was Marcia. Yeah, one thing led to another, and of course, uh, with my particular habits and desires, I had to get a date with her. And of course, you know, uh, poor girl, she just didn't know what she was getting into, but eventually we ended up getting married. And, uh, <laughs> You know, you al beat anything I ever saw. She made the statement, you know, many, many times before she met me, mind you, that there's one thing that she was going to do if she ever got married, and she was not going to marry a man that did not eat onions or that drank. Guess who don't eat onions and who drinks? But to give you a little idea of how lucky she was, we went to, uh, you know, got married, and I went back to the, to the university. I was going to start up there, and I started. And I had a little problem. I went in some of them old Marine Corps buddies of mine. And we decided to, to celebrate just a bit, you know, a few beers. And I got home two days later. And mind you, we've been married two weeks at this time. And I came in with one of them drunken buddies and a case of beer. And she got mad. Now, you talk about narrow-minded. <laughs> and don't worry, she, she's heard me say this before. But, you know, I have to give you, you know, the, the kind of sterling personality I had. And I was still having the problems with booze, and of course I did everything. I got kicked out of the university, of course. I took several jobs and get fired for it. No, I guess they fired me. Uh, several of them, you know. And then I, I thought about uh, these various uh, uh, great careers that I could do. And then I was at a place one night and uh, got into a little altercation and ended up getting cold cocked and they took me to the hospital. And I woke up and there was a very kind man sitting there and he gave me a shot and I assumed he was a doctor. And... Uh, it was a very nice shot. Boy, we sit and talked, and I mean, my mouth ran 100 miles an hour. And, you know, and he did this again the next day. And I thought, geez, you know, this is not bad at all. I don't care if I ever get out of here. <laughs> you know, a real nice guy. And he did this three days in a row. And then they, they'd call my mother and father and my wife. And then there was a couple of things that, that happened. One of them was I found out then that he was a psychiatrist. Well, I had never been around a psychiatrist, but uh, I figured out later what that 
joy juice he was giving me. But uh, he told my mother and father and my wife that I was one of the most known. Mind you, this is a guy that's wanting to be a big macho guy. And I'm all of 23 at this time. He said I was one of the most immature people he had ever run into. Now, boy, it's hard to hold your head up after that. So he gave us a prescription to give me and asked us to come back in a couple of weeks. We came back. And, you know, I guess I really shouldn't ever claim to have been halfway smart. I had brain damage long before I quit drinking. We walked into, and not into his office, mind you, at the hospital. We walk in. He takes us to this hospital room. I'm sitting there. We roll in a tank or two, no, two tanks of oxygen. Pop it up against the wall. And he pulls a pint of Jack Daniels out of his pocket. And he says, would you like to drink this? Now, that's the stupidest question on God's green earth. (laughs) Of course I would. And old Marsh is sitting there and not saying a damn word. And that's the first time she hadn't bitched about me drinking that I could remember in quite a while. So I do what you do. I drank it. I found out what that prescription was. It was antabuse. Yeah. Let me tell you, if you never drink with antabuse, don't. I'll guarantee you it'll make a lasting impression on you. They did this to me twice, and as I understand it, it was called the aversion therapy in these days. Well, anyhow, I ended up, uh, I'd heard about the big money and, you know, the typical geographical stuff. I went to California, and about the only thing that happened out there, two things. One, uh, I found out that, uh, you know, there is, well, they were paying people eighty dollars a week. My God, I hadn't seen that much money for you know, just for working forty hours a week. I couldn't believe that. But I could see me getting rich out there. But the one thing that happened is one of the first things we did. Old Marsha gets me down to the drugstore and says, "You know, let's refill that antabuse prescription." We go into this drugstore, and it's in Ontario, California. We go in, and of course, the guy fills it, comes back. And I guess it's as close as I've ever come to killing Marsha. She said, we didn't pay that much for it in Arkansas. I could have killed her. I thought everybody in the drugstore was watching, you know. You know how you are. This very kind druggist went back, looked at the government and said, no, ma'am. He said, that's the correct price. And the only reason I tell this is I found out many years later that very kind druggist was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in Ontario, California. And they're funny world, you know, and I didn't even know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous. The other one was my daughter was born out there. And, uh, she was born in a place called Covina, California. And of course, as usual, I did my usual bit. I had a couple of jobs, managed to drink myself into trouble and end up broke and having to call my parents to find a way to, you know, my dad came out and brought us back home. Only this time, and I did this several times even before this, and this begins a period of where I begin to hate Wayne Parks. Because you see, really, I wanted to be a good husband, a good father. I wanted to be a a good, responsible citizen, and I didn't know about alcoholism. I really didn't. Went back in this little town of Bentonville, Arkansas, and it was about, at that time, 2,500, 3,000. And those days, the operator came on the phone, you know, and said, number, please. And, you know, and they'd crank it over, and, of course, she spread the word all over town every time I got in trouble. And, you know, when it's a small town, and my mother and father were nice people, my wife's mother and father were nice people, come back and you'd begin to overhear things like, you know, is it the parks uh, uh, thing nice, or uh, is it that? That daughter-in-law of theirs, nice. Oh, that cute little baby. Isn't it a shame that that rotten son of the foxes? And they were serious. And I don't blame them. I was. I did everything you think I did when I was drunk. I'm the kind of drunk that drinks and I don't stay around and I'm gone for a week, month, and I may be anywhere. And I do every damn thing I can do. But I damn sure don't stay at home. And the rumors began to get around. And I began to get into trouble. 
And of course, you know, you've always got those that come up to the courthouse to see what the latest is, and I was there. And you get to a point, you know, you, you know, cold sober, you can't hardly face these things. And I was finally uh, uh, working at a place in, in uh, Rogers, and I moved to Rogers, a little town next to Bentonville. And somehow or another, it occurred to me that, that you know, if I was going to, to even make a decent living, I was going to have to have some kind of an education. I went back to the University of Arkansas on probation, but I graduated two and a half years later, had a degree in marketing and transportation. And doing that, how I did that, I don't know. I didn't know. I had a wife and a baby. I worked full time and I carried a full load at school. And I am the biggest idea. I only got drunk a few times. And I, to this day, I can't tell you why, how, or what. I just did. And I thought, well, finally, I'm going to have the life that I've always wanted. I'm going to be able to take care of my family, I'm going to get a good job, something that I can be proud of. And really, you know, I, this drinking and everything, that was just, I probably got over that immaturity and those problems. I went to work for a company called Phillips Petroleum. And I originally had gone there for, for the transportation department, but I ended up in sales and went to Denver, Colorado. And I got to Denver, Colorado, and I was given something that's the, probably the greatest contributor to alcoholism and hitting your absolute bottom that a man can have, and that's called an expense account. <laughs> and they said that they wanted me to entertain. <laughs> I tell you, you have lived, you seen me do the twist at the Peppermint Lounge. Uh, and it wasn't with my wife either. But uh, I lasted on that job for a couple of years, and I really did. When I worked, I was in good shape, and I didn't have any problems. But when I got lost for a week or two at a time, they seemed to frown on it. And uh, after a couple of years, they decided to allow me to resign. They said, don't fire you, they just allow you to resign. We've got to tell you one other little incident, the one that I told you earlier about. I happened to have a good friend, and we had a big sales meeting in the Brown Palace Hotel in the ballroom. And I, of course, had this good friend, uh, much like some friends I have around here tonight. You know, they, they said, you know, we're both drunk. But like, we've done our bit, and all these big vice presidents and things from the Bartles over there. He said, Wayne, you won't give a hog call here. He said, now, ask her better not here. He says, you're afraid to hear it. Now, you know, don't do that, you know. Especially, he was from Oklahoma. <laughs> well, you know what happened. I stood up on a table, and I gave a hog call, the suey pig, at the top of my voice, and I didn't stop with one or two. And, you know, I don't know if that contributed to my uh, notoriety or not. But uh, shortly after that, I was gone for about a week or so, uh, doing a little research to get here. And uh, they allowed me to resign. You know, here it is. I call this time. I hit another one. And I have to tell you, I was in two state hospitals and three private hospitals and drying out joints in a period of less than a year to give you an idea of how I was drinking at that time. And this is just in Denver. The thing that's interesting is I was passed out in the middle of my living room floor and the minister from the church that we had uh, started going to came by. And of course my wife let him in to see what was in the middle of the floor. And he wasn't shocked at all. And he gave me something, and he told me about Alcoholics Anonymous, or where they were, where they met. It was the York Street group in, in Denver, Colorado. And he gave me a 24-hour day book. And I'd like to tell you, you know, everything went great and everything. It didn't, of course, but I did go down there. And I did find out there is something called Alcoholics Anonymous. But the first meeting with Alcoholics Anonymous I ever went to was at the York Street group in Denver, Colorado. Well, Marsha had been, you know, after 13 glorious years of living with me, 
She was talking about this thing called divorce, and you know, she seemed to be unhappy. And uh, we decided that maybe we'd go back to Arkansas. One more time. And I can remember uh, loading up that old trailer with our possessions. I had just enough money to get them back to Arkansas. And I thought, well, if I can get uh, my wife and daughter back to Arkansas, at least our parents will take care of them. Because I didn't have any hopes much even at those times. And I hated myself so badly that it just, there's no way to explain it. And, and uh, she used to always ask me, and I'd be gone, I'd come in. And she'd say, why did you do it this time? And I'd say, I don't know. And she said, oh, don't do that. You know? But I was not a mean drunk. I didn't beat on my family or anything. But something that I hope I never forget. And I can see it just as well today as if it was yesterday. I used to come back from these drunks having done all the things you think of it. And I'd come back and I'd walk in that door and they'd go stand this, this little girl and her mother. They didn't bitch at me. They didn't do it. They didn't say anything. They just look at you with those hurt eyes. But, you know, I've, I've never forgotten those eyes. I have stayed drunk days longer just to keep from coming home. And looking at those other eyes. I hope I never forget that. Needless to say, ended up back there. People still talking. I couldn't hold my head up anymore. Went to work for a company, finally. And this company... As it turned out, I worked for them quite a few years, but they ended up firing me three different times. And during one of these little periods of me getting fired, Marcia greeted me one morning after I had been dropped from one of my extended drunks. And she decided that uh, she'd had enough, and she said that uh, she was going to divorce me, and she said, do you want me to call somebody? And I said, well, maybe uh, you, you call AA for me. And a couple of guys come to see me, a guy by the name Buster and Bill. And they were from the Rogers group. And I'd like to tell you that that saved my tail. It didn't. It took me another four years to, to get sober. It took me five years to get one continuous year, even after we were divorced. Now, I'll tell you, she divorced me while I was locked up in the state hospital in Arkansas. The old state hospital over on Markham, remember? Civil War. I want to tell you, that's something interesting. You haven't lived until you've been in this place. Uh, Charlie knows about it. These buildings were built during the Civil War. And I was in what they call A3 South. They give you those little green uniforms, no pockets, no matches, you know. And they kind of supervise your conditions of living. And my job, I had a job there. And my job was to feed the criminally insane women. <laughs> now, if you want to start your day off with a bang, <laughs> you started off that way. And they said I was depressed. <laughs> you better believe I was depressed. <laughs> But that was the period when Marcia chose to divorce me, the, at least the papers and everything. I got out of that place and, of course, went back and Marcia had left, taken uh, our daughter. And I ended up staying drunk for quite a while. During these periods, this company fired me three times. And the last time, the banker, and I happened to have been in charge of the books at the time as well as some other things, and the last time they fired me, the banker come in on it, and he said, uh, the gentleman's name that was ahead of this company was named Harley. And he said, Wayne, he called me up after the third fire, and he said, I want you to know something. He said, I told Harley Mosier that if he ever attempts to hire you back again, he says, I'm going to cut off every dime this bank has in that company. 
And he says, I am going to see to it personally that you never work there again. Is that clear? I said, yes, sir. And I did a lot of things, but I ended up finally, I got a job driving a truck. I drove a truck across country for six years. And I drove the way you think I did. But I found out something. I found out about the world of pills. And I found out, you know, guys, you know, I used to run with these guys when I first started driving a truck, you know. And we'd run up maybe to Chicago and back, you know, and I'd just be wore completely out. And them suckers were just moving right on. You know, and I thought, God, I must be weak. You know, those guys could just go forever. Well, of course, finally somebody took pity on me and they showed me what uh, little helpers you could get to stay awake. And I didn't forget those, I'll guarantee you. And that's what I did, in and out of trouble, come in, get drunk, be filled up. And I kept going down the tubes. And finally I got to a point I couldn't even drive a truck because I couldn't stay sober long enough. But I want you to know that uh, I never put a scratch on them all the years I drove. But finally got so bad, they, they finally took me to a place in Fort Smith that they'd heard that, uh, and this kindly judge, I wrecked two cars in two days, and there was a judge that was unhappy about it. And I took five parked cars on one evening. Uh, they get upset about things like that. And they kind of gave me a choice of going to jail or to, to go into this new thing called a halfway house. And uh, you're supposed to, in those days, just wanted to be sober two days before you could get in, and they couldn't get me sober two days. So they called up uh, this guy, John Purdom. He's dead today, one of the finest men I've ever known. But they called John up, and John knew who I was because I'd been falling in and out of the program. And John... He said, John, we, we've got Wayne Parks up here. And he said, the judge wants him to go to the halfway house there. He said, we can't get him sober two days. He said, would you take him if we brought him down? He said, bring the little bastard down here. <laughs> That's his exact words. And I went down there, and I have to tell you, I'm a typical drunk. I immediately proceeded to tell him after I woke up. Uh, that I didn't have time to stay there. You know, I had a lot of things to do up there in the hill. And there was an old boy, his name was Fred. He was a, a disbarred attorney. That was uh, the assistant uh, at this halfway house. And, you know, he had, the, he had a typical attorney's attitude, you know, just pure shit. But Fred was very kind to me, and he talked me into staying one week. He said, well, Wayne, you know, I think he knew. It. I think he knew. It. He says, if you just stay one week, maybe you'd have a better chance when you look back. Next Monday, or I come bouncing in there. I said, well, Fred, I've been here a week. I better go. And he said, Wayne, I'll tell you. He says, maybe if you could just one more week, maybe that would really help you. Then you could go back and start making a living and do all those things you said you could. Uh, well, okay, I'll give it one more week. You know, I didn't have to talk to him on the third week. I ended up staying there about six weeks. And I, I think it, that was kind of the turning point. Of and all this halfway house was, there was no formal program or anything. They gave us a place to sleep and eat. And they fed us AA. We went to AA meetings at night and we listened to AA tapes. One of the first things I heard was a gentleman that calls himself the Arkansas President, Charles. And this goes back in the early 60s. And I heard his tape. And I heard some others, a guy by the name of Chuck C. And I remember those tapes today as if they were really playing right in front of me. And that's all they knew about it. Halfway out of it. They give us a place to eat. So I left and went back. I have to tell you, that's where I also... Uh, the first job I had that it kind of held down was picking up trash and drainage ditches in a housing area with kids that lived in these homes that I had grown up with. I never have forgot that I sit on the edge of that ditch one day picking up trash. And I sit down and I finally accepted the fact that Wayne Parks had gotten Wayne for where he was picking up trash out of the ditch. First time I think I really accepted it. I went back and went through the same things, driving a truck, 
and you know, occasionally getting drunk, occasionally you know getting in a little trouble. They hated to lay me over. Now, if they got me going, I, I was pretty good. I wouldn't get drunk or anything. But if they laid me over, it may be days before they could get me out again. And they had kind of a compromise on it. Uh, they said, if he can sit up, let him go. <laughs> and uh, it's strangely enough, you know, I never did. I never had a wreck. And, you know, I, I didn't put a scratch on one. I did a lot of crazy things. And I was in Florida, too. But, you know, one night I came in, and I can't tell you that, that all of the drunks and everything, but I had to tell you that I came in one night, and I was to the point, the only thing I had was in the, that truck. And my mother would allow me to sleep on the couch in her front room. And I came in one night, and I'd been in and out of the program, in and out of the program. And I couldn't seem to ever get so, for one reason or another, I'd be drunk. And this one night I came in, and I was cold, sober. I'd been out on the trucks. Come in, it was about two or three in the morning. It's one of those tires, you know, that comes over you. That inside tire, the one that you just can't go anymore. And I thought, I just can't come back from another drunk. And I thought, well, I know I'm going to be drunk again. And I guess, you know, I'm going to die drunk. And I sent up a prayer to a God that I knew very little about. And I do choose to call him God. That if he'd just show me a way not to drink. Just to live without drinking. That I, I didn't have to have my family back. I didn't have to have a job back. I didn't want a single thing. I'd continue to drive a truck as long as he wanted me to. If he'd just show me a way to live without drinking. Nothing happened. I went on back on the trucks running around the country and everything, but up until today, I've never had another drink. That was March the 21st, 1969. I, I have a hard time even believing it today. I come back in, the, in and out, and several months later, they called me from the office one day, and I'd had about two or three hours sleep, and I went mumbling and cussing and griping. Because they'd call me in when I'd just gotten in and didn't have any rest. They called me in and asked me if I'd come to work in the office. And they'd heard that I might be getting sober. And uh, I sobered up on those trucks. And I drove without pills, believe it or not. I learned how to drive without pills. And I drove and I thought, you know, if I had to stay on the trucks, that's the way it was. And anyhow, they brought me into this office and another... Uh, asked me to do some things. I was safety director <clears throat> and a number of things at this company. A couple of years go by. These people that fired me three different times come call me up and ask if they'd meet with me one day. And I said, well, sure. And I knew he'd known him for years, you know. And I got over there and he and his son were there. And they said, Wayne, we won't beat around the bush. He says, we've heard that you straightened your life out. He said, we'd like for you to come back to work for us. And I said, oh, Harley, haven't you had enough? And he said, no. He said, uh, if you'll come back, he says, uh, we want you to come back this time as an officer of the corporation. And my immediate reaction was, I said, have you talked to Gene, who is this banker? <laughs> and I, because I remembered what he said. And he said, he's the one that said to come out here and get you if we could. Seventeen years later, that mean old banker told me almost to the day how long I'd been sober and I hadn't seen him for seventeen years. Isn't that something? So I did. I went back to work for these people. Stayed there for quite a few years. And it was long about this time, and I have to tell you, right after I got off the trucks, and I want you to you realize the job that I have now. I want to tell you how I got into service. It was light about this period of time. I was at the meeting and everybody was so thrilled that old Wayne finally made a year. They just couldn't hardly believe it. I was going out of the meeting one night in Buster. The guy called on me the first time. He said, Wayne says, we're going to have a GSR election here. And he said, uh, why don't you run? I said, no damn way. I don't like to talk in front of people. I just want to be left alone and do my thing. 
And he said, besides, I got to go to Little Rock and they get down to all that damn politics. I don't want none of that. And he said, well, okay. He said, uh, if you don't run, he says, uh, old Hubert's going to run. And he says, he'll probably get it. I thought about that a few minutes. I said, I believe I'll run. <laughs> now, I got to tell you about Hubert. Hubert was an attorney in town. I don't like attorneys. And I don't like Hubert. And that's the reason I even ran the GSR. Well, for some crazy reason, I got it. And I went to one of those area assemblies. They gave you $10 to go 200 miles down there. That's 400 round trip. Yeah, yeah. I went down there and I got in the damnedest mess I ever saw. And I saw some people there that were not kind to each other. And there was one lady there that just scared the hell out of me. And she was about five foot tall, about five foot wide, smoked cigars. <laughs> Hannah. Well, I'll tell you, I got in that dress and I thought, my God, well, I just went ahead and took a few notes and got the hell out of there. And I, I did the job for a couple of years. And I came back home and Long about this time, uh, Marcia came back to the area, her and my daughter. I have to tell you, I went to court a time or two, uh, and I'd only been drunk, uh, sober a few months trying to get my daughter back. Had no place, no money. Had no place to put her, but I'd take Marcia into court just so I could get her back. And the judge wouldn't give her to me. I did several little tricks along this time. I have to be honest about it. Let me tell you another little trick. It just crossed my mind. I hadn't told this on Marcia. I'm going to mention that when I call her tonight. You know what she used to do to me? You know, I was out there, you know, slaving away on those old trucks. You know, and I was trying real hard to make those child support payments. And you understand, I had expenses and everything. When I old Marsha, you know, she'd save up these damn checks for about four or five months that I'd sent down, you know. And I don't know how you are, but when I was drinking... If there was money in the account, I took it out. She'd bounce them damn things into that check four or five at a time, and of course they'd just bounce like crazy. And she did it on purpose. I don't know, I may have a resentment about that. I'm going to have to talk to her about that tonight. <laughs> that still kind of halfway hacks me off. Anyhow, old Marcia would come back around there, and we were getting along pretty good. And You know, I was going to these GSR, you know, going down there, these things. And Marcia and I were talking. She'd go with me occasionally to make a thing. Uh, come around time, you know, for the GSR time to be up and rotating. You know, everybody said, well, what are you going to do, Wayne? I said, God, I'm not going to be in this stuff anymore. Uh, that's it. I'll, I'll be at home. And Marcia said, we you going to continue to go down? I said, no, that we rotate out and I'm through. Let's go down to the last meeting and come back home. Marcia goes to see her and she says, uh, well, I says, you're through now with that going to Little Rock, aren't you? I said, well, no, not exactly. Uh, I said, I'm in the area treasure somehow or not. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> she said, the area treasure? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, you just take care of the money. I said, oh, no, I can't find the, uh, the previous treasure. And it took me six months to find the previous treasure. And, you know, when I finally found this old boy, uh, and I asked him about, the, you know, I said, how much money have we got? And then it went under $67. And I said, fine. Uh, I said, just give me a check for it. And, and uh, where are the books? He said, got no books. I said, well, how do you, how do you keep track of everything? It's simple. He says, you know, if, if we spend any money, I write a check for it, pay for it. And he says, they give us money, I'll put it in there, whatever the balance is, that's it. Well, you know, that's simple, but it's a little too damn simple. And we had a few problems with finances there, you know. Uh, we had a doubt that they had to go, number one, to, to the conference. And $167 wouldn't get them there. So I went up and borrowed some money and put it in there so we could get them in. Managed to get through two years of it, and... Uh, you know, I had learned something about standing up here and asking you about money. 
you know, the thing that, you know, you don't want to talk to drunks about. Well, I learned that you do have to talk to them and tell them, you know, you're broke. You know, give us some money or we're going to have to call it quits. And you can get a little money. Well, two years of that, man, I'll tell you, I was glad to get out of that damn job. Marcia said, well, you're through, aren't you? And I went by to see her when I got back. She says, boy, aren't you glad you're through with that? And I said, well, uh, not exactly. <laughs> uh, she said, what do you mean? I said, well, I don't know, but they elect me treasurer again for another two years. She says, my God. And I said, yeah, I know, but God, they asked me to, and I don't know. I, I'm afraid, I guess, to say no. So I did it another two years. Same thing. Found a little up there, you send me, come back. Same question. Well, you're through now, aren't you? I said, no, I think I'm going to She said, what? I said, well, they elected me the area treasurer, or the uh, uh, chairman of the area assembly. She said, I thought you were going to quit. I said, well, I was. But uh, they're starting two days assemblies, and they want me to be the... And I said, I really don't know how it happened. And she kind of looked at me kind of suspiciously. But bless her heart, she didn't say anything. And it was long about this time that uh, I had run across this deal, and I'd bought a house, and I'd moved my wife and daughter into it. And, uh, you know, it was coming up a long weekend, kind of like Labor Day weekend. And she kind of put a question to me. He said, Wayne, you know, I says, uh, you don't go with anybody, and I don't go with anybody. We just go with each other everywhere. It's been going on for years. We're living in your house. And you're still living over there in that room. She says, doesn't that strike you as a little bit strange? <laughs> I answered, well, I guess so. He says, you know, says, don't you think we ought to, to do something about it? Uh, so we decided, a great momentous decision, and what the hell, one more divorce wasn't going to kill us. Why don't we give it a whirl and see what happens? And that's been 16 years ago. And I don't know, we may get it right yet, but... Some interesting things have happened along this period of time. You know, I got to see a couple of things. You know, my daughter grew up, and I got to be a part of it. And I got to see her graduate from the University of Arkansas. And, I, I, you know, I, up until today, my wife and I, and we've had a few little battles. But up until today, neither one of us has ever used the past on each other. Up until today, it has not been necessary for us to ever use the past on each other. Now, we've had some choice comments to make, but she's had some choice ones about me and my service work, too. But anyhow, I uh, was involved, in, and if I got through the, the uh, chairman's job, and, of course, same scenario, through, yeah, this is it. Boy, this is a tough one. I don't want Glad to get out of it. Same scenario, come back home after area assembly. And I was elected the delegate for Arkansas. And I said, you know, I told her I was going to have to go to New York. And she just, you know, he said, I, I thought that you said you were going to get out of all this. And I said, well, I was. But, you know, I, I, I'm just doing what they asked me to do. And I really, I, I really didn't think that I, uh, I'd be elected delegate anyhow. But, uh, went on, went to the 79. Ken and I were together. As long about 80, I started my own little business and everything. Well, I knew when I got through with, with being a delegate that I'd had, that was it. I absolutely was through. There was nothing else I could do. And I got through with that when I come in and told Marcia that, yep, I'm through now. She said, great. I'd started my own little business. And I was, you know, managing pretty good, and, and things were pretty good. And I didn't have any, I, just like uh, uh, Tip O'Neill was saying here. Uh, you know, I could sit back in, in the back of the room, and I could sit back there, you know, then, and, you know, you can sit back there when you're past delegate, and you can look real wise, you know. You'd say, I wouldn't have done that. 
I know how to control these things. They're going to have to learn how to control these meetings. Now, I would have done it. It's nice. And I was enjoying that. I had no problems with that whatsoever. I was down to an area assembly, and there's another friend of mine, uh, Charlie, that we always stayed together at the area assembly. Many of you know Charlie. You know what a sneaky sucker he is. Uh, we were talking one night at the area assembly, and he said, Wayne, there's a lot of them here at the area assembly. We'd like to put your name in for the Southwest Regional Doctor, or the Southwest Regional Trustee. And I said, oh, 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 no, you don't. No way. I'm through. I've got my own business. I've got everything going fine. No way. They mouthed back and forth a while. He said, you know, Wayne, he says, how many areas do we have in, in the South West region? I said, 11. Hmm. He said, if you would put your name in, that'd just be one out of 11, wouldn't it? He said, it wouldn't be much likelihood of you getting elected anyhow, would it? <laughs> well, I thought about that. You know, that's, that made sense, because nobody knew me. I didn't have money. I wasn't a speaker. I said, ah, sure, go ahead, put it in. Forgot about it. Went on from here. He went on about my business. And in April, I'd been up in Missouri on a job and come back and turned on my recorder. And I heard this squeal come over the phone, uh, over the recorder, and I thought, my God, and it was our delegate from Arkansas named Elsie, Elsie Murphy. And she says, hey, Wayne, you're the new trustee. <laughs> and then a familiar voice came over it. And it said, well, Parks, don't get too damn happy about it. It says, you came out of the hat just like the rest of us. Now, that voice, I won't mention David A.'s name. <laughs> but he sure knows how to get to it. And he was on the recording, too. And I'll tell you, uh, uh, I absolutely, there's no way of explaining how shocked I was at it. I really was. And I have to tell you, some of the things that, that you know, when you're in that job, I, uh, when I took it, I had to remember some of the things that had happened through the years in this little town. You know, I can remember going into a church one time where nobody in the church would speak to me. I can remember what I felt like when there were none of them in that church and my daughter was going to be baptized. I remember that. I remember the feelings. To sit there shaking to death, trying to be sober so you could see your daughter one night. I can remember many of the things that were said. I can remember all of the humiliating things that had happened to me through the years. It took me two years to hold my head up after I got sober. I never got to where I could forgive myself. And I began to remember all those things. My wife came home and I said, you know, my wife, uh, I got a call and I said, they elected me trustee. And she looked and she says, oh my God. And we talked about it. And she said, well, Wayne, she says, I guess you'll just have to do it. So I did. Yeah, and I thought of all those things and there's this scared little guy he couldn't even hold his head up. He couldn't even talk in front of people. He was going to be the trustee from the Southwest region. You know, it didn't make sense. But I have to tell you about my Southwest region. Fine much people supported me all the way. Little group from Rogers. But it was eight men and one mean woman who happened to be my sponsor. Uh... That little group had grown to where we had 17 meetings a week. That then. And I thought of all of these things, and I thought, well, you know, you try. You do. And I had all these people that were helping me. That Southwest region, that fact, David, took me in and taught me a lot. And I, mean, I thought, boy, if I get through this, and I was just involved in quite a few things as trustee, and finally, I got through the four years as trustee. And I thought, Jesus, you know, thank God there is not another thing I could possibly do. <laughs> and I knew that, you know, it's kind of like being educated beyond your intelligence. I knew that I'd been handling a job that was far better than I was. So I knew I was safe. And, of course, there come a time, 
some people talked to me and asked me if I'd consider putting my name in for the job that I now hold. And I thought there's no possible way that I could do that job. They never get anybody but somebody from New York anyhow for that job. You know, as insecure as I am, you know, I never think I do a good job. Now, I, I, so many, many people out there, they're far better than I am. You know, why me, you know? And I thought, I just don't believe I'll send my application in, or my resume. So, uh, there'd been some people talk to me, and so it come to the last day to send the resume in, and I was over to see a guy that I was sponsoring. Has a donut shop there in town. His name's Jerry. And Jerry, I come walking in, we went back to the office, had some coffee and eating a donut and talking. He said, why don't you send your resume in? I said, no, I won't be able to send it in, Jerry. And I said, yeah, there's too many good people out there that are better than I am. He said, Wayne, didn't you tell me that, that when we were asked to do something that we always did it? And I looked at him and I juice. <laughs> That's the rottenest thing that you can do to a sponsor, <laughs> is to hit him with his own words. <laughs> so I did. I went back and sent the resume in, and of course, I ended up getting the job, and I went to work there as a replacement for John Bragg, the general service office, in January of last year. I now live in the city of New York, 38th and Madison, right in midtown Manhattan. And uh, work in that office. And I have to tell you that, that uh, you know, to say that I felt insecure is the understatement of the year. But there's something throughout all of this that, you know, that uh, through the years I always wondered why me, you know, because I'm the most inadequate, the least, least likely of anybody. You know, I'm a little run of a guy that's scared to death to be up in front of people. I ran scared all my life till I got to this program and I found out how to live comfortably in this program over a period of years and I learned how to live comfortably with Wayne, something I never knew existed and I found out it didn't have to be anybody but just me. But you know, all of this service work and everything, I, I, I never intended to do any of the jobs, I really didn't. And I just showed up because they told me I had to do whatever I was asked to do. And of course, obviously, I was the winner. But I thought a long and a hard time about it. And the only thing that I've ever been able to come up with that makes any sense to me is that, you know, uh, I've done one thing probably consistently and I've shown up. Whatever it was, no matter how scared I was, I'd show up and see what happened. And a lot of things happened. But, you know, just showing up, you know, it's hard for God to work through you if you're not there. But then, you know, there's still just me. Nothing spectacular, no great talents, nothing. And then it dawned on me one day, you know, if you were, were trying to make a point, what would you do? You know, and, and I choose to believe this, at least tonight. I think that God chose me, not because of any great talents or anything. But I was probably the most unlikely person to do the jobs that I've done. No talents, no money, no great speaker or anything. The least likely of all to be the general service office manager today. But yet, with his power, with his guidance, and me just showing up, he's taken one of the least likely of all in AA and made them far more than they ever intended to be. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.